Okay, so it's uh, 7.05, so I would suggest we start because we have plenty to discuss tonight. Unfortunately, um, most of them are not joyful things, but I think it's also a really good moment to remember um, that we're all here together, um, that several conflicts and several movements for freedom and self-determination have been happening over the last years and decades. And one of them is, of course, Syria. Um, so I welcome you very much to the event, Serious Ongoing War and Lessons for Ukraine, a discussion with Yad Majed. Very warm welcome to you, first of all, to Paris. Hi. Yeah. And um, I'm delighted that we were able to put up this discussion tonight um, jointly with the Disorient and um, also Nautilus edition, who have basically published the book that Ziad had written um, back in 2013. So this is why basically we are talking to, uh, about it today, but also because, of course, when we look at Ukraine, there's a lot of lessons we can learn from what has, has been happening to Syria in the last, um, in the last 11 years. Um, so before I start, um, maybe just a quick word to myself, and then I would like to hand over to Christoph Dinkelaka from um, this Orient, and then I'm going to um, quickly introduce uh, Ziad and Harald, the translator of the book from French to German, without whom we wouldn't be able to read the book. Um, and then I will walk you through, quickly through the schedule for tonight, and of course for you as an audience to also know when is the good time for your questions, your comments, your remarks, and your thoughts. Um, because we, of course, aim it to be interactive. Um, so my name is Christine Lüttich. Uh, I have been um, living and working in Syria for around four years until the revolution started in March 2011, when I was forced to leave the country and had to move to Beirut and Lebanon for several years. And during this time, I basically got to know the initiative Adopt a Revolution that was uh, back then founded in late 2011 aiming to support the civil society movements and initiatives that were arising back then, and basically creating what is called um, the Syrian uprising, and later on was just referred to as a Syrian conflict or war. Um, and I'm very happy to, um, to do this uh, event tonight together with uh, Disorient, a dear uh, befriended organization, I would say. So I would just quickly pass over to Christoph, the, one of the founders, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you very much, Christine. Good evening and to everyone on behalf of two co-hosting organizations that are called Disorient and Ashart. Ashart conducts political study tours and digital tours to many destinations, mainly in Western Asia, Central Asia, and Northern Africa, with a focus on encounters, encounters with, with activists, academics, and so on and so forth in order to do to counter stereotype narratives. And this is one aim that the other organization I represent tonight has as well. This is Disorient, inspired by post-colonial and feminist approaches. We try to work with, not on, but with um, people in Western Asia and Northern Africa to counter very negative media coverage. Um, we do this through journalistic work. We do this through educational work and it's uh, Honestly, a great honor to be part of um, this event and I wish you all the best for tonight. Okay. Uh, great, uh, thank you, Christoph. And then maybe um, before we I quickly introduce Yad and Harald, I just want to directly show the book because of course this is um, why we're talking about it tonight. I don't know if, if it's possible to read it because it's maybe upside down, um, but it's called Syria, uh, Syrian, die verweiste Revolution. Um, and um, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Ziad, the author of the book, but also Harald, who has been translating the book. And Ziad was born, maybe to just give you a quick um, introduction, Ziad was born in Beirut in the 70s, um, he's, or in 1970, he's a political scientist and professor of international relations at the American University of Paris, but he has also been working at the Lebanese Center for Political Science and the Lebanese Red Cross and is one of the co-founders of the democratic left movement in Lebanon. Um, and of course, Ziad publishes a lot in French, in Arabic, in Lebanese, Syrian, uh, on Lebanese, Syrian, Arab politics. And I would add, though, this is not something he would maybe advocate for. He's also a human rights activist and a defender of the freedom of speech. So very well, warm come to you, um, Ziad. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And I would also like to welcome Harald. Harald is a historian, political scientist who works as a translator and journalist, and he publishes mainly on West Asian and North African issues and US foreign policy. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us tonight, Harald. Um, 
Before we start into the discussion, um, I would like to quickly um, give the word over to Zia because he wanted to say some words on why he was has been writing this book back then in 2013. Um, what were his motivations and also to give a, a, a moment to Harai to say, okay, why was the translation so important to him at this point of time? Thank you, Christine. And I'm really honored uh, to be here uh, tonight and uh, to share some thoughts uh, with you. Uh, I'm uh, honored as well and grateful to uh, the editions, Notelius edition, and to Harold uh, for the publication of uh, the book. And I'm very happy to see friends uh, attending, uh, Yasin Hash Saleh and many, many others uh, tonight. Uh, what I want to say briefly before we go into the discussion uh, is that the idea of the book uh, came uh, while discussing with some friends here in Paris about the perception of the Syrian revolution uh, way before it turned into an armed conflict and then into a war, uh, but all signs of, uh, um, let's say, uh, a disastrous situation were already there. And around us, especially in the uh, network of leftist intellectuals, of um, even people who might have some good intentions, there were many questions, worrying questions, about Syria and about the revolution, either uh, with some uh, a priori concerning uh, Islam and concerning stability, uh, or about the conspiracies and uh, uh, about the fact that the geostrategic uh, uh, considerations impose uh, themselves. And in all those questions, uh, the Syrians were invisible. Uh, the Syrian sociology, the uh, uh, Syrian struggle for decades uh, was never uh, mentioned. Uh, and at the same time, uh, there were uh, lots of uh, talks already about uh, the fact that the conflict is going uh, to become an armed conflict, that there will be many interventions. So all of those uh, thoughts, uh, I tried to uh, write the book uh, with, uh, at the same time, answering uh, two challenges. One is to write something that is accessible to people who don't know Syria uh, enough, who are interested uh, in, in getting some information about the Syrian regime, about uh, why the revolution took place, uh, what happened during the first years of the revolution. And second, to those who know about Syria, how to try either to give uh, an alternative narrative to the one that was dominant in, in some media circles and in some intellectual circles, and at the same time to deconstruct those uh, the, the uh, arguments of those who were opposed to the revolution from the beginning, uh, using the same uh, questions. Uh, why not talking about this event? Why not talking about that country? Why only talking about Syria? Only, always displacing the topic and displacing the uh, discussion uh, to put them in something uh, different, uh, way uh, beyond the Syrian borders and what was happening in the Syrian borders for decades. So that was the idea of the book. And uh, then it developed into also giving some, um, some images, some ideas, uh, trying to, uh, through writing, uh, making visible what was happening inside Syria at the time to, 11, uh, to 2011 and 2012, and to talk out about some individuals, about some projects, uh, giving uh, the Syrian revolution the uh, context and the human aspect the human dimension that many were trying uh, to confiscate or at least to occult in the uh, media uh, and in the uh, dominant uh, discourse. Thank you, Ziad, for making this also um, yeah, understandable for us because a lot of years have been, passed, have been passing. So um, maybe some people also wonder why um, this book is still relevant. We're going to discuss this, of course, tonight in length, I hope. Um, I would also like to give the chance now to Harald to add on that. So why did you feel also that translating this uh, this work that has been written in 2013 and all these insights are relevant today? And why does it have to be accessible to the German audience? Yes, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this event, the revolution and uh, this Orient for uh, this discussion. And of course, yet for writing the book and for discussing with us here. Uh, the translation of this book has a longer history. Um, a few years ago, some friends and I um, planned to translate and to uh, publish a series of book on, books on Syria. And that proved to be a quite um, complicated and um, difficult endeavor. 
because um, most publishers seem to think that the topic Syria um, would not meet with too much interest within the German public. And uh, also, I think that um, in many cases, people thought that this was just another faraway conflict that was very complicated and difficult to understand. And what was not understood was that this was not just uh, a war, but also an authentic revolution. Um, that makes me very grateful uh, to that uh, Ito Nautilus uh, uh, had the courage to, to uh, publish the yes, important book in German. Um, I think that it becomes very clear when we look at the situation today that the book is important, that it's important to uh, discuss Syria again uh, with um, Putin and the Russian troops attacking, attacking Ukraine. Uh, a new dimension of Syrian, the Syrian tragedy has become very clear, I think. One gets the impression that uh, Putin is following the same script, the same play, playbook uh, that he had for, for the invasion and in, for the uh, attack on Syria. And this is a script that's really um, the script of horror films and the script of death and destruction. Let me just mention three, three different points here. Um, Airstrikes and attacks on residential areas and civil infrastructure, hospitals, for example. Uh, here, has, Syria has also served as some kind of, um, let's say, a testing ground for new weapons in, in, for Russia and uh, also uh, as modernization uh, for Russia's armed forces. This is connected with uh, the siege of cities and civilian population and the establishment of so-called humane corridors, which in fact are nothing more than, um, let's say, instruments of expulsion and ethnic cleansing. Um, another point is propaganda. In Syria, Putin uh, fought, as he said, against terrorists and uh, Islamists. Now in Ukraine, he says it's Nazis and uh, fascists. And against this background, I think the book can possibly, hopefully, contribute to bringing the war and the resistance in Syria back into the public consciousness. Um, this is even more important as the Assad regime um, today uh, has increased its attacks on the Syrian population again. Um, so I have to say that this war and this conflict and this resistance by the Syrian people is not over, it's far from being over. Um, so all I can say now is uh, just buy the book, <laughs> read it. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you, Harald, for again also highlighting the link of the discussion tonight, because basically when we discussed uh, three weeks, three, four weeks ago, um, how we are going to link um, um, the discussion of the book um, on what is happening, we really felt that it was an important urge not just to disconnect these struggles of, uh, of, of human beings for freedom and also for self-determination, although the context is very different, but still this kind of aggression and the lack of impunity and the lack of uh, accountability, something that is very much in common. And this is why we decided to, to join these questions. So I suggest that we start um, to um, dig deeper um, in um, questioning Ziad a little bit. Um, just two more little things before, before we start. Um, if you have questions, please write them in the chat. You won't be able to say them aloud. Um, so we can keep track because we're already 130 people almost. Um, they will be collected by Jennifer, who is so kind to support us tonight in uh, managing the questions. And then um, we're gonna have around 30 minutes now of an input um, and dis a moderated discussion between me and Ziad. And then there will be plenty of time um, um, around 7.50, we will start with a Q&A. So we will read your questions, group your questions. We will be able to debate together. So I hope um, that you all be able to um, put in your, um, your aspects uh, of your questions. Um, the one person is asking about the title. So all the information about the book, so I'm just putting it here again from Nautilus. You can also find it in the event on Facebook. So there you have a direct link where you can order it. Um, this is regarding the chat. Before we start, I just wanted to all us take a minute and dive back into what was this uprising that we are today celebrating the 11th anniversary, unfortunately, um, while 
the fighting is still continuing and people still haven't received, uh, haven't seen their demands um, uh, achieved, is to draw back a little bit and why people um, were so much moved and why a, lo a big part of uh, the Syrian society basically joined this movement. So I would like to read a quote from one of the partners that Adopt the Revolution has been supporting for a long time in Eastern Ruta, an area that was completely erased basically by Russian and uh, Syrian airplanes in uh, April 2018. And so um, the, her name is Iman. She was a very young um, uh, activist in, uh, in Eastern Ruta. And she said the following, it's a quote from a book we published last year, um, Zehn Jahre Syrien. And she said, the protests were aimed exactly at what I had experienced. To free a society in which everyone's ambitions, hopes and dreams of us, young women and men were even forbidden to exist. Now we could and we were allowed to take a free initiative to improve our society. Together with other women, I set up an initiative that was exclusively, exclusively dedicated to women-related matters and that aimed to free women from the social isolation and marginalization into which they were forced in many places by the patriarchal macho society that Syria had been. So maybe Zia jumping from that quote to just highlight a little bit this moment of freedom also. Um, what is so still current about the book? What, why is it still relevant to talk about? Okay, now just also allow me to clarify that for the uh, German uh, version, uh, there was an update when it comes to the book. Uh, the book was translated, but uh, I've added a chapter on impunity uh, and on the series of crimes that were committed uh, during the uh, Syrian uh, revolution and war. Uh, and uh, there was also a kind of uh, looking into the last few years uh, through um, not uh, writing uh, uh, what happened uh, after 2013, but looking at major developments since 2013 and until 2021. So there is an update. However, what was uh, for me uh, striking at the beginning in 2011 is similar to what was just mentioned in what you wrote, uh, read, Kristen. Um, we were uh, waiting each uh, Friday for the demonstrations uh, that were full of hope, of joy, of humor, uh, deconstructing the dictatorship through humor, through challenging it, uh, through slogans, uh, the incredible courage that we saw in the organization, uh, in the sit-ins, uh, in the way people uh, were really, and it's not a metaphor, were destroying the wall of fear, uh, were liberating their, uh, their tongues that were for decades uh, under uh, the uh, censorship and uh, the whole generations of Syrians who spent years in jail, who were, uh, who, who were not capable of changing things. There was hope in 2011 and many of us followed it and thought that this incredible courage and determination should lead somewhere. Unfortunately for the Syrians and uh, due to many, many reasons that we can of course analyze, as of 2012, uh, we had the impression that already uh, there is a new configuration uh, due to regional, uh, international uh, uh, questions, but also uh, due to the uh, ADN or DNA of the regime itself. Uh, violence is by itself the policy of the regime. It's the politics of the regime. Uh, the regime does not just use violence to reach uh, some objectives. Uh, violence is its philosophy. It can take uh, different forms. Uh, and we have seen in Syria, it was a laboratory of violence. Uh, all uh, aspects and all techniques and all industry of violence uh, was uh, experimented uh, there and impunity allowed it to continue and to continue and to continue. Syria represented, and that's why I think the book is still and many other books are, are relevant. Syria became a kind of a political laboratory, uh, not only in terms of what I just evoked uh, the oppression and its institutions and the way systematically uh, it takes place. Uh, this is the first conflict in modern times where we have at the same moment local actors with regional actors, with international actors, and then you have state actors, you have non-state actors. In terms of those who came to Syria, uh, first Iran mobilized a series of militias from the region. Uh, there were later the jihadists who came 
uh, to join uh, Nusra and the Islamic State. Uh, uh, you have, uh, at the same time, mercenaries that were brought by Russia, the famous Wagner uh, Society, and then you have the Russian army itself. Then you have uh, many armies that in between uh, went and uh, intervened as well. So you have many layers in the Syrian conflict. And through those layers, the Syrian question and the original uh, uh, question, uh, the people's aspiration for freedom, for dignity, uh, I'm not saying that it was lost, but it disappeared when it comes to the uh, series of confrontations that uh, Syria was, was witnessing and continues to witness, fragmenting its territory, uh, fragmenting uh, the population, displacing more than half of the population, killing and, uh, I mean, and injuring hundreds of thousands. So uh, there is something very special about uh, this conflict. And uh, I think uh, if one wants now to read how historically it evolved, uh, we can say that each summer between 2011 and 2018 was a kind of uh, game changer or modified what we had before in Syria. So summer 2011, after six months of peaceful mobilization, of demonstrations, of sit-ins, uh, the first signs of an armed struggle uh, appeared. It was clearly uh, now, uh, it was clear that many people are thinking that the armed struggle could be the way to overthrow the regime. It was clear that the regime was encouraging that as well. Uh, it didn't want the peaceful uprising or the uh, revolution to continue the way it was. And anyway, occupying all public places by tanks and by armed vehicles made it very difficult for people to keep demonstrating. Nevertheless, there will be between summer 2011 and summer 2012, two parallel tracks, one that is related to armed struggle and the other continued with peaceful mobilization, with medical doctors devoted to uh, helping uh, the injured demonstrators, with the uh, local committees organizing events, uh, with uh, social media uh, covering all that, with the humor that I mentioned, with still the hopes. 2012, another turning point. This is the first time when the Syrian regime started using its air force and its ballistic missiles, uh, making life impossible in the areas that were liberated from uh, its occupation and from its control. And this is, uh, in my opinion, more important than what happened in summer 2013, because in summer 2012, uh, if those who pretended to be the allies of the revolution allowed the delivery of the MANPAD, the uh, anti-air missiles to the opposition, at a moment when al-Nusra was not yet a strong actor, at a moment when Daesh did not exist, uh, this could have been sent a message, could have been a real message to the Russians that there are serious red lines, to the regime that its uh, airplanes will be shut down when they go and bomb civilians in the areas that were not under its control. And this didn't happen. So this was a first sign that the Russians understood that the regime understood and that the Iranians understood, meaning that MANPAD uh, anti-air missiles will not be, be delivered and the American administration uh, made many justifications for that, that can be easily uh, in fact uh, uh, shown wrong. And uh, it was much more a fear that things could go faster than the administration could uh, deal with. And uh, after 2012, the jihadists also started to arrive uh, Hezbollah officially had the first funeral of one of its fighters who died in Syria. So that 2012, the summer, was terrible. 2013, this is... But the maybe, yeah, happened. just, to, uh, just yes. to maybe jump in, because um, the title, I think it's very telling, you chose that you already, I think, touched about, uh, uh, on it a little bit in your explanations right now. The title of your book in English is The Orphaned Revolution, in of Deutsch, uh, Die Verweiste Revolution. So... Why do you think, so? because right now we were focusing a little, uh, very much on state perspectives, right? Uh, regime perspectives, um, government perspectives, but why also did a large part of the world public not show or very hesitantly show solidarity of its Syrian revolution? So what does it, how does that also come in? Maybe it's a good point to just uh, look at that. Yeah, yeah I, I, will, I will just to, to briefly finish because uh, the, uh, it, it, it makes sense as well to explain why it's orphan. 
uh, when the red line in the summer 2013 was crossed when it comes to the chemical weapon and nothing happened, it led in the summer of 2014, indirectly it contributed also to the rise of Daesh and to the fact that the conflict was uh, becoming everywhere and uh, no control uh, whatsoever of its dynamics were possible. Then 2015, Russia intervened directly. And from 2015 until today, were almost seven years of Russian intervention, no sanctions were made against Russia. Uh, that also, this was a clear message that Russia has full impunity in addition to its veto right in the Security Council. 2016, uh, we had the uh, Aleppo, at the beginning of, of the fall of Aleppo. And then uh, 2017, Raqqa, and uh, 2018, the Huta and then Dara. So each summer meant something. And in each summer, the revolution appeared orphan, uh, not only because internationally there was no uh, direct state support, but also because when it comes to intellectuals, when it comes to those uh, militants, to those who usually take positions, when there are noble questions, when there are uh, issues of struggle for freedom, for dignity, uh, most of them are from the left or do have a leftist background, we saw them silent when it comes to Syria. So the idea of an orphan revolution where millions of people were trying to seize back their right and to uh, uh, construct their, their destiny, their country, uh, they were sacrificing lives and, and, and everything and did not have the support they should have had uh, from the international left, from the prog progressive intellectuals, from many uh, categories in the public opinions who usually are mobilized for these kind of struggles and of questions. So this uh, push us to think why, to ask this question, what happened, uh, why it was not attractive enough, what happened in their minds, how did they see the Syrian revolution, is it related to the fact that there is a certain culturalism that we might even call racism uh, that does label populations or consider that violence there is part of normal life. So people are born to die and to kill. Uh, in fact, even uh, people like Obama mentioned the fact that uh, conflicts in that region have always been there and will always continue to exist. So there was a kind of labeling the, the Syrian people when it comes to violence or when it comes to questions that we don't know who is the one who kills whom or who is the responsible of the crimes. Uh, that the Syrian opposition did not appear uh, as uh, a one solid movement that is coordinated with a clear leadership or that the figures of the revolution inside Syria were not uh, seen outside Syria when it comes to women activists, when it comes to people like Razan Zaitouni, when it comes to the medical doctors, uh, those who will found many uh, projects and many experiences in Syria. So all of that was invisible. And uh, the same rhetoric about regional and international questions and about the role of imperialism, the role of some uh, reactionary Arab governments, the fact that the Assad regime has uh, taken historically some stances against uh, imperialism, all of that uh, played against the revolution. And I think that one now with what's happening in Ukraine as well, can observe a certain trend among many leftists that is anti-political science, anti-historical uh, science, uh, political sociology. It only refers to the same question, to the same uh, actor, the United States, whatever the conflict is and whoever the belligerents are. So uh, this is a way of uh, not respecting, I mean, even academic disciplines and materialist approach and Marxist approaches when giving the same answer to any question everywhere in the world with uh, a certain arrogance as well in the sense that we know more than you Syrians what's happening in Syria. We know more than you Arabs who are emotional and who might be guided by remote controls uh, by those who have the invisible hands of the conspiracies. Uh, and all of that made the revolution uh, orphan made Syria orphan and uh, contributed to the uh, terrible laboratory that Syria uh, was transformed into, uh, a laboratory of violence, a laboratory of torture, of using all kinds of weapons, of barrel bombs, of uh, systematic uh, rape, uh, of interventions. Uh, and uh, Syria became as well the land of impunity. 
Now, some people might say that it is not the only case of impunity, which is true. We have impunity in Palestine and under the Israeli occupation. We have had it for decades. Uh, we had it in Iraq. We're having it now in Yemen. We had it in the Lebanese war, in many other places in, in, in the map, and maybe outside, of course, not maybe outside the Arab region as well. But let me say that since uh, the uh, violence in Syria became uh, so barbaric in the way uh, many actors deployed it against the Syrians, and especially the Assad regime and its allies, all conflicts that followed the Syrian conflict became much more violent as well. Uh, look even at Israeli operations in Gaza after 2011 in comparison with before. Uh, there, there is much more possibility of deploying force and, and bombing civilians than before. Look at Yemen and the war uh, in Yemen between the Houthis and the uh, Saudi alliance, the Emirati alliance. The same, many Arab regimes now use violence against their opponents and dissidents and torture in jail. And they always would say that anything anyway, we're not yet in Syria or we didn't reach uh, the uh, intensity of violence that people witnessed in Syria. So Syria not only was a laboratory, but also became a case study and became a reference in impunity and in deploying violence without fearing the consequences and the implications of that. So maybe because now we are already in the middle of the conversation, of course, and now I have to improvise because some of the questions um, you already, I mean, brought up a lot of questions. So one of the aspects that you mentioned is this a laboratory and of course we talk a lot about it when it comes to the Russian military, um, not only in terms of uh, new weapons that have been tested, proudly tested by Russia on the Syrian ground, something that is maybe not known to the bigger audience, but also when it comes to military experience. Um, but before we jump to that, I would like yeah. to change perspectives a little bit again from on the grassroots side, because it has also been a laboratory for Syrian society to self-organize and to emancipate itself. So I would be interested maybe um, not to draw back everything, how it happened, but also if you look at it from today's perspective, what has prevailed, what has prevailed from this uprising that uh, continued for several years? In fact, what prevailed is mainly the fact that Syrians are uh, much more than uh, in any time in their history uh, capable of writing their stories, uh, of uh, documenting what they lived through, and even if at the beginning, many of them were still um, connected in a way or another to the trauma of uh, Hama. Hama is a city in Syria that witnessed in 1982, a terrible massacre uh, by the regime forces following an uprising by different oppositions, among them the Muslim Brotherhood. Many thought after 2011 that Hama is not possible anymore because now we're documenting, now uh, we're visible, now media, will cover what is happening in our country and the world has changed. Except that Hama was produced and reproduced and reproduced many, many times between 2011 and, and yesterday. So uh, I think the Syrians learned after that, that it, it is their responsibility now to document, to write their story, their modern history, to defend their, their cause and uh, uh, to highlight the experiences that they have built through the years and I think one, uh, looking at the documentation effort, the Syrian uh, conflict is the most documented conflict in history. Not maybe um, documented always in an efficient manner, but it is a real case of documentation that can one day lead to a series of uh, judicial uh, uh, and political and uh, uh, all kinds of work could be done based on that documentation. Uh, in Syria as well, a literature developed uh, following the, the uh, years of, of war and of displacement and of exile. And I think there is a new generation of Syrians, whether born in Syria or in the different places where they are today, in Lebanon, in Turkey, in Jordan, in many Arab countries, uh, but also in Germany, in Sweden, all over the world. Uh, those people are learning and are witnessing things and do have as well their uh, political consciousness that is uh, going to, to have an impact on uh, their lives. There were, of course, uh, you mentioned the experiences inside Syria of uh, organization on the ground, local councils, the coordination committees, uh, the series of initiatives during the first years of the revolution, and even later in some 
of the uh, liberated area or of the areas where the regime lost control, uh, many councils, uh, schools were still working and organized. The whole medical sector that was bombed by the Russians and by the Syrian regime continued to function uh, with uh, uh, devoted white helmets and many other bodies that worked. Uh, you have uh, uh, those who, uh, as well in Syria, showed uh, solidarity uh, initiatives uh, in the different places that were besieged or in the places where uh, hundreds of thousands of displaced people arrived and tried to make their uh, life uh, or to build their life uh, again there. So I think there were lots of uh, achievements, but unfortunately when the war continues and when the, the uh, horrors continue, uh, we cannot always see them. We will need some time uh, before uh, re-examining the Syrian theater and the Syrian scene and uh, draw lessons about all what uh, the uh, Syrians lived through and built through the years. But I know that in terms of the arts, in terms of the visual arts, in terms of cinema as well, in terms of culture in general, uh, there is a new emancipation and lots of dynamics uh, that uh, are important and uh, will uh, keep questioning uh, the world and will keep uh, imposing on the world to read uh, and uh, as we probably all are witnessing today with the Ukrainian war, many media are once again, or not once again, are talking for the first time in some cases about what Putin did in Aleppo, about what Putin did in uh, the Ghouta or in other places. Yeah, yeah. We did not I... hear that discourse a few years ago when this was taking place. So also it's... it showed that the narrative of the Syrian people will reach uh, one day the uh, mainstream media and will become part of an international uh, public opinion and public view of what really happened in, in their country. Exactly. And maybe this is something that for us as Adopt a Revolution has also been striking because, of course, I mean, many of these initiatives that you have been mentioning are still active inside Syria, simply because many people were not able to flee the country. Um, so one of the things that really struck me a lot is I think we published several days ago a piece that was written in English originally by um, Syrian feminist and activist uh, Marcel Shewaro. She's a very well-known activist to many who have been following the Syrian uprising and the Syrian um, conflict. And there's an ongoing very sad joke we are right now doing within Adopt a Revolution and it's called, we told you so, yeah. hashtag. And I think one of the things that was striking to us was in this piece, but also in many of the conversations we had with our local partners. Um, and there I would like also to you now maybe quote one of the partners we have inside Syria, Huda, is that basically said, we are in disbelief that this is happening again. We have been witnessing, we have been writing about it. We have been documenting our death, our injuries, our displacement, but no one was believing it or wanted to look at it. And now we're doing it again. And what was very striking and emotional for us was to say that while Syrians are witnessing this again, and this is still happening, basically, it's not over just for us to remind that again, we are in the 11th year also of atrocities being committed against yeah. civilians. There was a huge wave of, of the solidarity from Syrian activists and initiatives, even based inside Syria with the Ukrainian people, something that really, really like gave us goosebumps in the, uh, when we were sitting together and talk. And Huda, and maybe to jump on the role of Russia and how this also really was a game changer. I mean, you said 2012 was a game changer in terms of how the conflict unfolded and how basically there was no way maybe back. But then when Russia entered the um, uh, with its forces on September 13, uh, 30, 2015, so more than uh, six and a half years ago, um, it was basically a game changer in the sense that while the Syrian, by the friends of the revolution, the so-called Western countries and other um, countries um, were basically just administering what was happening. There was active support by the friends of the Syrian regime, so as to name them Russia, Iran yeah. and Turkey. And uh, Huda, and she's a female activist that we are supporting, she has been displaced from uh, Eastern Ruta and she's now still active in Idlib. Um, she said the following about uh, Russia. Russia said terrorists, and they meant us civilians, targeted attacks on markets in which more than 100 people were killed and one fell, have been part of our everyday life ever since. It has used bunker busting missiles and shelled medical facilities and schools. The Women's Center Iran was also hit at the time. 
a young English teacher was killed. I still remember to this day the crying of her infant crying for his mother in hunger. And while you remained silent as we were assassinated and fled, Russia largely achieved its goals. It paraded the West, destabilized Europe, and expanded its geopolitical role. You allowed all of this, and now, like us, you stand before the ruins of your politics. So Ziad, when you listen to this, maybe to also yeah. with what is happening today, what are the thoughts that come up to you? Yeah, in, in fact, just a clarification, I, I think you, you mentioned Turkey as an ally of the regime. Well, uh, of course, it, it's not an ally. Uh, Iran and, and Russia, uh, with all the militias that uh, Iran uh, mobilized uh, and with the um, passive approach by many Western countries uh, allowed uh, Russia as of 2015 uh, to become the decisive actor in the Syrian uh, conflict. Because if in 2012, the victory of the armed uh, revolution appeared to be difficult. With 2013, it appeared that Syria was abandoned following the uh, crossing the red line of the uh, chemical weapon. And as of 2015, it was clear that overthrowing the regime was not possible anymore uh, unless Russia approves it because uh, Russia tried in 2015 uh, to uh, at the same time imitate the United States in 91 during the first war on Iraq by deploying its military force, by using uh, strategic and tactical missiles, even from the Caspian Sea, uh, by all air force attacks and the, the, the different weapons that were, uh, uh, that were uh, deployed, but also uh, the US 2003 war on Iraq that happened without the United Nations Security Council approval, uh, uh, very similar to what Russia is doing now in Ukraine. In 2015, uh, and until today, uh, Russia officially declared that first in October 2017, the Minister of Defense of Russia said that 200 new weapons were used, were tested in Syria. Four years later, in 2021, he said that 320 weapons were tested in Syria, meaning were tested on the infrastructure, on the population, uh, on military targets, on hospitals, on schools, uh, so it was a laboratory, even not as a metaphor, politically speaking, but in terms of the destruction and in terms of the crimes and no sanctions were ever taken against Russian officials because of what happened in Syria. There were few sanctions because of the 2014 Donbas war and the annexation of the uh, Crimea, but not for all crimes that were committed in Syria, documented in Syria, even more. The United Nations said that it used to give the Russian Air Force some coordinates or addresses of hospitals so that they are not bombed by the regime. And the result was that they were the same hospitals were bombed and were targeted by sophisticated weapons to make sure when they are underground that they are hit and destroyed. So there are a series of war crimes and crimes against humanity that are documented. But once one, we know that the Security Council should seize uh, the uh, Syrian question so that the, uh, the, the court uh, would examine it and uh, see what kind of crimes were committed. And uh, this will always be faced by a Russian veto, which takes us to another question that is the whole international system, how unfair it became, how obsolete it is uh, when it is paralyzed by five members who have the veto, veto rights and who can use them now not to keep certain balances uh, or certain equilibrium when it comes to international relation, but rather to protect their uh, allies, to protect some regimes who are violating international law and uh, committing war crimes. So the Russian intervention in Syria, you can uh, look to many similarities, uh, as it was said at the beginning when you started and when Harald evoked three levels of comparison, even the question of propaganda uh, that was uh, used similar uh, software, similar terminology to justify the war. And those who uh, today support Russia in Ukraine used similar arguments as well when they used to support Russia in Syria, or if they pretend that they don't support Putin, they will say exactly as some people used to say before about Assad and Putin, that well, we don't support Vladimir Putin, However, and after the however, they give all kinds of justifications for his war, for his invasion, 
either blaming NATO, and NATO definitely could be blamed for many, many mistakes, but this cannot justify the invasion of a country and its destruction. Or in the case of Syria, uh, blaming all kinds of conspiracies and that uh, Putin and Russia would like to uh, defend their ally. And uh, in fact, this is also part of the Russian propaganda at the time that had some uh, appeal and, and did have a certain success among many regimes even in the region. That is, we are loyal to our allies. We don't abandon our allies as the Americans abandoned Hassan Barak and uh, uh, Zain al-Abdin bin Ali and other allies. While we, after being uh, betrayed in Libya, we will not allow anything to happen in Syria. But even this thing that was supposed to happen in Syria was not in the agenda of the Western actors themselves. And this is the dilemma of Syria. Many were opposed to the Syrian revolution, pretending that there are some people manipulating it in Western capitals, while the West itself on many occasions show, when I say West, I mean governments, of course, showed how not interested it is and how low on its priority Syria is, uh, either because uh, they didn't have a clear vision on where to move and how to move, or uh, because simply they did have many problems in their own countries with the rise of the far right, with the rise of new political culture that is very much xenophobic, that is opposed to any kind of refugees. Uh, America, after the wars of Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, Obama was elected because partly because he was promising less American engagement in world affairs and more focusing on domestic questions, on economic issues, on racism, and on many uh, national priorities. Uh, so the West has been for the last two decades in a new approach to world politics uh, where priorities are not to direct involvement, are not to direct engagement, and the Russians know it. And that's why all what they can keep bringing as an example is the United States in Iraq in 2003 and the lies of the Secretary of State Colin Powell in the United Nations when he pretended Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And through that lie, they keep using it in order to say that nothing proves what uh, you are saying today is true. Who said that chemical weapons were used? Who said that hospitals were bombed? Who said uh, that uh, the opposition to Assad is not just the Islamic State and the jihadists? Always asking questions to create doubts and to relativize any truth, to make truth, in fact, something that you will never find. So it's enough to have one mistake in one picture uh, on uh, the net to decredibilize uh, a series of uh, uh, narratives, of experiences, of testimonies, and always to use the counter propaganda, uh, as we are exactly seeing in Ukraine today, uh, to qualify the enemy by being neo-Nazi, and yes, there might be neo-Nazi groups in Ukraine, exactly as there are fascist groups in Russia and in many European countries. Uh, and yes, there were jihadists in Syria, exactly as uh, they might be uh, Shia jihadists defending Assad as well. Uh, but this cannot uh, in any case explain not only the, the situation, but even a small part of the situation. But this propaganda that was tried in Syria is tried today in Ukraine. And I think that more and more in Europe, there are people, uh, if we put aside uh, those uh, uh, categories of the, last, of the left, who will always copy paste their arguments and answers, whatever the question is, there are more and more, I think, in the European and in the Western public opinion, an awareness that what we let happen in Syria, in terms of the displacement, in terms of the bombing, in terms of the torture, in terms of the propaganda, we are now paying the price and we are witnessing it on our continent, directly on our land in Ukraine. Now, of course, you can understand yeah, why let, in Europe, yeah. just I will finish here. Okay. You can understand why in Europe, people can be much more connected to the Ukrainian question, but this cannot justify the racist uh, comments by many politicians and, and media, uh, I mean, workers uh, who uh, said that the Ukrainians are like us, uh, or that uh, we feel more sim sympathy because they're just white and Christians, uh, while we don't have the same 
uh, feelings and emotions, concerns when it comes to the Syrians, to the Iraqis, to the Afghanis, and of course, to the Sub-Saharan Africans who were left uh, to die in the Mediterranean Sea before maybe this uh, is a very good bridge, uh, 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 So maybe as a last question, and then we should um, give a possibility to um, look at the questions and start the, the interactive part in this, um, in this evening, is that if we look at the whole situation, and this has been showing in many different contexts and conflicts before, is that basically we see that from a governmental side, this promise of protection um, of civilians has not been basically uh, fulfilled, right? It has been um, it has been voided of any sense. I mean, there are even resolutions like the responsibility to protect, but of course it would require a lot of, um, yeah, let's say uh, um, commitment uh, politically, financially, also militarily humanitarian that has never been basically um, um, or very rarely realized. Um, if you look at the UN system, and you have heard described this very well because of the veto, because of a very um, long needed reform in the UN Security Council, basically you have perpetrators of war crimes and crimes against humanity like the US, like Russia, like China, um, who are basically able to veto themselves um, and protect themselves. So, and then you have, of course, everything that is called the call, call, so-called political realism that many analysts loved and many politicians also advanced by saying we don't have any real interest um, as people who demand protection for civilians you are dreaming we would like to but this need realistic of course this is kind of ridiculous if we look at where we are standing now today whether it is in syria or ukraine or many other conflicts so let's change the perspective for this last um the last uh, the last minutes of our discussion before we enter the q a so from as someone who is also not just an academic, but also looking at from a movement perspective. And you have talked about the failure of or the lack of solidarity, I would say, from, uh, from international peace movements and other movements with the Syrian cause. What can we learn regarding Syria, but also Ukraine on how these movements and these initiatives, and I guess many people who are listening and watching tonight, what must, must we work on? What are the questions we have to address so we can also face this kind of um, ambitions that governments have to always basically keep postponing, keeping up the status quo? Mm. Well, I, I don't have a clear answer, uh, Christine. Um, uh, we, we kept uh, saying in meetings and um, in encounters and debates uh, that uh, we have, we are, we're lucky to be in uh, democratic countries where uh, we can criticize uh, the, the governments here without fearing the implications of that. Uh, while those who are here and are fan of Vladimir Putin, uh, they can go and try to criticize him in his country. So based on that uh, question that is related to the uh, possibility here to be politically active, I think pressures in all democratic countries on their governments to review uh, the way this whole international system functions, the way the EU functions, uh, the way the series of institutions uh, that were built after the Second World War, World War and that are today less and less efficient in managing crisis. And uh, even those who keep talking about realism, we're seeing that we are moving from one conflict to another, from uh, one disaster to another. And uh, none of them can pretend that uh, with realism and with accepting statu quo, things will really remain uh, stable and nothing will threaten them in their own uh, land uh, when a world is becoming, regardless of all the, the barriers and uh, the walls that are now uh, built, uh, is uh, you cannot keep people from moving and from trying to uh, go from one place to the other. So no one can isolate himself or herself from what's happening elsewhere. And that's why I think our responsibility duty uh, in democratic countries is through the political movements, through new movements, through civil society, through initiatives, writings, is to consider that what's happening elsewhere is also important for us and that there is an international system that needs to be reformed. Uh, you take the, the uh, Security Council, there were some uh, constructive uh, recommendations, including by some countries like France uh, in one moment, uh, that the veto right should never be used when it comes to questions of war crimes and crimes against humanity. But of course, to reach that, the Security Council itself 
should approve it, which is impossible. So there is a need everywhere to have a pressure when it comes to this veto question, when it comes to the rules of impunity, when it comes to the international responsibility and to the response to the series of crises that is different from what we're having, because I don't think anyone is secure or satisfied. And what happened in Syria uh, can be reproduced. Syria made all horrors possible in, in a way and made all violations possible. And we will see them more and more if uh, nothing is done to bring in some amount of justice. No one can be uh, that optimistic or think of, of justice tomorrow or after tomorrow, but some degree of justice, some level of justice uh, and ending uh, some uh, forms of impunity would be uh, the starting point. But this would require a strong public opinion, similar to uh, public opinions that were built in some moments in history uh, around the Vietnam War, uh, around uh, many conflicts and events that happened, uh, something similar to what we are seeing more and more uh, in, in terms of the new generation and the climate change question, how to build consensus about specific reforms and to create alliances all over the world to push for them and to benefit in democratic countries from the poss possibility of uh, building those alliances and uh, imposing uh, through elections, through pressure, through demonstrations, what is needed to uh, to reach them. Of course, this is difficult. Uh, and of course, I don't pretend knowing how to do it. But uh, I guess that the Syrians and many of them are, are starting also to think beyond Syria uh, and uh, to, to consider Syria a human condition uh, that one needs to study, uh, to draw lessons, and to examine the world uh, from through Syrian lenses. OK. Yeah, I think so building alliances and also like getting into touch directly with those who are concerned instead of just talking about them is something that we have um, learned the hard way throughout the last 10, 11 years, because this is one of the things that uh, we as a doctor revolution um, try to do. So um, thank you very much, uh, Ziad, you tried to do the mission impossible, which was um, yeah. in you. half an hour drawing like the bigger lines uh, from what we have been witnessing in Syria for the last 11 years. So I would start moving toward the question. So there is a question by Nico. So I'm going to read it out loud. I have observed a certain distancing of the left from the case against Russia's war of aggression by creating false balances and shifting a lot of the blame on NATO. This is especially relevant regarding the quasi-colonialist idea of spheres of influence that is mentioned again and again. Could you, Ziad, please compare this tendency to the abandonment of the Syrian revolutionaries by the Western white left? Yes, we, we try to evoke it, but of course it, it uh, deserves a long discussion. When it comes to Syria, uh, many of the leftists, not only Western leftists, even Arab leftists, uh, reduced the question uh, to anti-imperialism versus imperialism. So if Saudi Arabia pretends that it supports the uh, revolution, then automatically you should be on the other side. Uh, if Iran supports the regime, it means that the resistance axis against Israel supports the regime. Or if Assad uh, criticizes American policies, it means he's an anti-imperialist who deserves uh, to be uh, supported, regardless of anything that is related to Syria and the Syrians and the millions, the tens, uh, the millions of Syrians and all what happened in Syria and around it. So there was a kind of uh, a simplistic approach by uh, by the left, and this approach, that's what I tried to say, is neither Marxist nor materialistic nor uh, related to political sociology, to history, to international relations. It's the same software that is lazy, that is arrogant, and that imposes itself wherever there is a conflict. You can look uh, for an invisible American hand somewhere. You can look at previous American wars and previous American interventions and consider there is something similar taking place. And you position yourself. It's easy to say I'm against the US propaganda. And all this, we don't know if it's true or not. Uh, so I support uh, the regime. And I don't know who those revolutionaries are, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, when Daesh appeared, uh, in 2014, it was a gift for the regime and its supporters. Maybe because they would keep explain saying, that Daesh is the Islamic State. So I'm not sure <coughs> yes, sorry. Yeah, apologies. Yeah, absolutely. The Islamic State, either us or uh, or the Islamic State. So yes, it's better for many 
uh, to have uh, Assad than to have the Islamic State. And anyway, if you reduce the Syrians between those two barbaric choices, uh, it is, uh, uh, once again, it's a kind of racist uh, approach, as if in those societies, nothing can be produced but violence and but dictatorship on the one hand, and the nihilist jihadists on the other. So the left fell in that uh, trap. And uh, I can see it today as well when it comes to Ukraine, exactly as uh, you said, Nico, which is the NATO, the expansion of the NATO, as if even if we consider that the NATO was going to expand, is this reason or does it justify an invasion and destruction of a country? Knowing that this is also wrong because technically NATO stopped uh, expanding in the East in 2004 in the Istanbul summit. Uh, when Ukraine tried in 2008, its uh, request was rejected because the system of Ukraine itself did not meet the NATO requirements. Then in 2014, technically, no country that is already in conflict can join NATO. So the whole question is not there anymore. And the countries finally who joined NATO, uh, which joined NATO, the uh, Baltic uh, countries, and uh, when it comes to Eastern Europe, Poland, uh, uh, Romania, and Bulgaria, in fact, uh, today they feel secure because of that. Uh, and if Ukraine joined NATO before, maybe the invasion wouldn't have taken place. So I think this whole question is, uh, in a way, a matter once again of making the real history of Russia, Ukraine, uh, inappropri inappropriate to explain what's taking place, to make Putin and his series of wars in Chechnya, in Georgia, in Ukraine itself in 2014, in Syria, plus the assassinations of his opponents, uh, plus uh, his intervention recently in Kazakhstan, in Belarusia, make all that irrelevant and just keep saying, NATO, 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 America, America, America. This is this is becoming uh, so sad when it comes to some leftist intellectuals yeah. who surrender to this easy way of uh, deleting political science and just keep blaming uh, a country that is to be blamed for the series of interventions and crimes in yeah. history. Ziad, I will this have to jump in because we have more questions. So, um, so I will I will be a bit stricter moderating you. You forgive me, but I just want to be able I will to follow. all the questions. So Jalal Jezairi um, asks, how can we compare both Syria and Ukraine when in Syria there is a semi-legitimate regime inviting the Russians to help and Ukraine is a democratic gov government fighting under Russian occupation against Russia? So where are basically the limits of comparison, he's asking. Yeah. Now, uh, if we take international law, uh, it's true that the Syrian regime that is recognized and uh, kept having its seat in the United Nations asked Russia to come and to bomb its own population. Uh, while in Ukraine, it was not the case, except that Putin also said that the people in the Donbas asked for the Russian protection from the genocide, as he said, uh, that they were victims of from the government of Ukraine. So first, the comparison is in the justification. In the Russian case, I want you to come and bomb uh, the people who are opposed to me. And here, I will intervene to protect people from genocide. Now, if you say Assad is semi-legitimate, uh, sorry, but this is wrong. He doesn't have any democratic legitimacy. He has been in power for, in 2015, already 15 years, following his father who stayed in power for 30 years. He was never elected in any election. There were never free elections in Syria. Uh, and uh, the majority probably, uh, if you don't want to follow uh, uh, a certain percentage that we don't know, but a, a majority of, of people in Syria, if you look at the map of the demonstrations, at the map of the fights, uh, in terms of the displaced people, in terms of the refugees who don't want to return to Syria as long as Assad is there, consider Russia an occupation force in Syria and consider that its resistance is legitimate as the Ukrainians today consider uh, theirs is very uh, legitimate. So the comparison is in the Russian aggression on the one hand, in uh, the fact that uh, there are complicities with this aggression in different circles. Exactly, so we are trying to draw parallels instead of saying everything is uh, similar, of course. Yeah, and of course the uh, historical context and the geographical context also is very, very different. Uh, uh, Syria is far away from yeah. Russia, Ukraine, there is a long history and there is this whole extremely difficult transition in Russia from the empire to the nation state that they are not recognizing. They still have lots of ambitions around them, territorially and politically speaking. 
And you but of course, I think another level of comparison could be just to quickly jump is this also that, um, I mean, for those who are familiar with the Syrian um, situation is that half of the population is either displaced within the country or are refugees outside the country. So we talk about roughly 11.5 million Syrians living either in IDP camps inside the country or in neighboring countries or Europe. And this is, of course, if you look at the Ukrainian influx um, of refugees just in the last weeks, of course, the escalation is much quicker. Um, the escalation of use of violence um, is much quicker when it comes to this um, external aggression. Yep. But also when it comes to the destabilization that this might have on the neighboring countries, on the European countries that are bordering Ukraine, I think this is something that we have seen very much in the Syrian, um, in the Syrian situation, looking at Lebanon, looking at Jordan, looking at Turkey, but also other uh, Iraq. So this is also something that um, one shouldn't overlook. So there's another question by Taisire Karim. He asks, based on, so now this is a tricky one, um, based on what we know about the dynamics of 11 year long conflict in Syria, how do you see the future scenarios for the Russian invasion in Ukraine? Yeah, but, well, I, I, it's, uh, I can't answer the question. I don't know what will happen in Ukraine. What is clear, however, uh, in Ukraine so far is that uh, it's not only a matter of occupying Ukraine by the Russian army. It's also a matter of destroying the infrastructure of the state, uh, destroying the military, uh, making the annexation of the Crimea and, and the uh, Crimea and uh, uh, the, the Donbass uh, a reality on the ground. Uh, and uh, probably imposing a uh, long siege on Kiev to end with uh, uh, the current government there. Uh, but there is something that is related to the destruction of the Ukrainian state, not only of a military invasion. I don't know how the resistance of the Ukrainians will be uh, and what kind of uh, role the international community or what is called the international community will play in support of that resistance. Sanctions might harm Russia with time, more and more. Uh, maybe uh, one could also hope that in Russia, uh, those courageous people who are demonstrating against the war and showing uh, real devotion uh, to, to peace uh, might also modify the configuration. But I think it's a very difficult situation and will continue to be very, very difficult on the ground and politically. Yes, and I think what we have also learned from Syria, unfortunately, is that um, even when there is cracks within the elite, the military elite or the, um, let's say, the economical elite, the, crypto the kleptocratics, it has been very little because usually the sanctions and also the lack of external, um, of external relationships basically have contributed to the fact that a lot of the higher ranking elite don't have any real interest in in defecting. So this is something that um, unless in Syria, more like low or middle ranking officers and um, business cronymen have defected, but not the higher ranking ones. So um, might be a tough one. I would jump now a little bit to the Syria general questions because we don't want to focus just on Ukraine. Um, there's a question by Ben Greschenke, and I think it's a very important one that I also have been discussing lately with friends. And that is, of course, steers up a big debate in the German um, in the German peace movement. So this question of weapon delivery. So he asks, would it have been an alternative for Western governments to deliver weapons to Syria? If so, to whom should the weapons have been delivered to? Yeah, now, now of course, uh, today it's too late, but at the time, uh, yes. And uh, the argument that some today, I hear it as well when it comes to Ukraine by uh, some either pro-Putin or who do not dare that to say that they are still with Putin, but uh, all their arguments uh, justify the war, is that if we deliver weapon, it mean we add to the violence an additional amount of violence, and that will make the conflict longer and will lead to more victims, etc. Uh, the, the counter argument is that if weapons are not delivered, so the idea is that the Ukrainians today or the Syrians before have just to surrender and to be uh, massacred by the powerful uh, Russian army or the Syrian regime army or, or, or. So in some cases, sending weapons could be the best way to limit the damages of the war by forcing the strongest to understand that he cannot continue and that a, a compromise is needed. Or at least if it does not limit the war, it allows people who want uh, to defend themselves and to resist whatever the cost is 
to do it in an efficient and uh, in a uh, in a well I mean uh, organized manner. In the case of Syria, yes, if anti-air missiles were delivered in 2012, this is a political message that the regime is not allowed to use its air force uh, as it did to bomb any region that went out of its control and to make life impossible in that region. Uh, we could have imagined many scenarios if the north and the east and the south of Syria was freed and not bombed in terms of political experiences, in terms of the, of the uh, displaced and refugees who could have stayed in Syria uh, with lots of hope to build something alternative, even in terms of the rise of the Islamic State and the jihadists in general, if all the Syrians who are outside Syria stayed in those regions and were not bombed by the Air Force, they could have modified the whole situation in this area. Leaving the Syrians to the Air Force and to the barrel bombs, to the destruction that happened, allowed Russia later to intervene as well without the fear that it might lose anything, militarily speaking, while in the air and while bombing the civilians and the fighters of the opposition. So yes, if the, the, the weapons were delivered to the Free Syrian Army that existed at the time or to some groups who were under the control of, uh, in fact, when you deliver sophisticated weapon, you need to train those who will use them and you might know who is using what and where, uh, you can locate them, uh, the new, uh, generation of weapon might even have a digital print. So if it's stolen or lost, no one would use it anymore. There are lots of things that could have been done, but this was not the case. And later the argument became, we don't know who's who and to whom we can give it. Uh, it might fall in the wrong hands at the end. This was after 2014, but between 2011, 12, 13, it was very possible to have the Syrian free army and many of its divisions in different places uh, uh, using those important devices and other forms of weapons. But of course, and maybe this is a good um, transition for the next question by Christina Bendig Laranjo. Um, she's asking, I mean, there have been many Syrians, especially when I was at this point in, in Lebanon, um, who were really reluctant of picking up the arms, right? They said yes. that we are a peaceful revolution. They saw also that there's a, um, the risk of jeopardizing, that there's a risk of little um, of uh, war empires and warlords that were rising up. Um, so those who wanted to act uh, peacefully, and so here she's asking speci specifically now about the Syrian diaspora, um, what can be their role now in like contributing to the future of Syria, yeah. especially when it comes to like a hopeful transition in the future and a challenge to basically re reunite also the population. Yeah, and, and thank you, Christine, for the comment you did at the beginning. Uh, I, I was never an advocate of an armed struggle or of the militarization of the revolution. In fact, I even wrote a few pieces before the uh, militarization became a, a fact on the ground, uh, opposed to it. Uh, without pretending to know what might happen, and I never knew what will happen anyway, and I don't think lots of people, they, it's easy now to say we knew what, that this and this will happen, but in one of the article, based on the Lebanese ex experience, I evoke the warlords and their culture and the fact that when you receive weapon, those who will uh, deliver the weapon will have lots of conditions, and that will weaken the power of the Syrian cause, uh, and I was not at all with the militarization of the revolution. But when the militarization became uh, a reality. And when the Syrians were massacred and had some of them had to seize weapons to defend themselves, or when they thought that maybe through armed struggle they can overthrow the regime, one cannot keep saying that, no, you have to remain peaceful. No, keep accept to be massacred and killed and tortured without retaliating or without liberating regions in Syria. One should, uh, follow that and try to uh, help as much as possible. Uh, and at the same time, I know about negotiations that happened in, in many places when it comes to the weapon and who could receive them and how and why. But there was always, when it comes to a certain level of, of arms, uh, a no that was categoric and did not allow the armed struggle itself to uh, reach uh, other, uh, I mean, to reach some of its objectives. After that, after 2013, 14, 15, etc., we all know that even the armed opposition became fragmented and warlords culture imposed itself and violation and abuses uh, by those warlords uh, took place in the liberated or in the free, uh, freed areas. And many of our dearest friends who were 
the, the icon of, of the uh, peaceful revolution, Razan Zaytouni, Samir al Khalil, uh, many, many others were kidnapped by even uh, armed groups uh, belonging to the opposition. So it's clear that many Syrians wanted to remain peaceful and thought that the peaceful way is the best way. Uh, but I'm talking about realities after the militarization that happened. And today, the Syrian diaspora and uh, people who live in, uh, in areas that are not uh, uh, under the control of the regime, uh, I can't uh, tell them what, what is their responsibility, but I think uh, uh, more and more awareness about the Syrian question, uh, speaking to people in their language and in their uh, direct, uh, I mean, contact and environment, keeping the Syrian question alive, uh, uh, working on the issue of impunity, uh, reminding people of what happened in Syria in the light of what's happening today in Ukraine. Uh, all of that, showing solidarity with the Ukrainians, uh, showing solidarity with the, uh, all people who are under oppression, making more and more uh, what, what Yassin uh, Hash Saleh uh, evoked as the Syrianization of the world, but from the uh, other side now, meaning uh, the awareness in the world about Syria and not only how uh, some parts of the world are becoming uh, similar to Syria. So there are lots of things that could be done. And I think with the uh, amount of writings and translations and debates and discussions and Syrian uh, publications and initiatives uh, with time, if, I, if we compare it to the Palestinian question and how uh, long it took for the Palestinians also to have their own uh, narrative and to, 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 to have a presence in the uh, international arena, it, it takes time uh, and I'm sure uh, one day it will happen. And more and more, uh, once again, what's happening in Ukraine is creating much more awareness uh, on what's happened in Syria than we, uh, we thought it, it might be and then what happened a few years before. Yeah, maybe to add a small word, I mean, because we are also as the Doctor Revolution supporting several initiatives and youth initiatives that are um, that are active, basically active here in Germany as diaspora groups. And what I find quite quite impressive and really gives me a lot of um, strength for the future is that there um, are people really gathering to have like political camps and debates uh, among themselves. You know, a space they never had inside Syria because when before the revolution, this was impossible. You were you were prosecuted, persecuted. So more than three people gathering was basically an illegal assembly, and you could be detained for that under the uh, terrorist uh, under the emergency law that has been installed in '63, and that was only lifted very lately, I think, in 2012. Um, another aspect is so then when the revolution started from day one, there was sharp gunshots fired. There were people directly being detained, injured, tortured in hospitals. So there was never basically the space for Syrians to gather and to really debate in a controversial sure. way about what is their opinion on their future, on the questions they have in terms of personal rights, status rights, economic um, perspectives, yes. um, what kind of um, governance form they want to have, but also what way of how does their being here affects them. So I think there is a lot of things uh, that, are, that are happening right now and what makes me very positive or keeps up my optimism is to see that a lot of people have been repoliticized by coming to yeah. Europe because they basically found, let's say, a, a bit of safety and a space to, re to take up debates, which was not possible basically inside Syria or in the neighboring countries because it was so difficult also in terms of living conditions. And Christine, this reminds me also of a question that we used to hear a lot about, uh, we don't know what, what is the alternative to Assad or that we don't see uh, Syrian figures who might uh, replace Assad. So uh, the, the first answer is that it's not up to you to see or not to see. It's up to the Syrians uh, to see if there is an alternative or not. And the second is that Assad uh, did everything possible not to allow any potential leader or a potential leadership in Syria to emerge. The whole policy and politics of a dictatorship is anyway not to allow the uh, alternative to appear. Nevertheless, there were lots of Syrian individuals, lots of Syrian groups in the first years of the revolution who were active, who played a role, uh, who could have uh, had real leadership potential uh, to lead the opposition and uh, to prepare maybe something different, except that they were arrested, they disappeared in some cases, they were assassinated, uh, they uh, were forced 
to leave uh, Syria. So everything was made to keep them invisible or to keep them incapable of federating their efforts to create something alternative or something different. Uh, so the issue is not that they do not exist. The issue is that they were killed, they were displaced, and they were not allowed to work, and they were not helped and assisted enough by those who pretend to be the friends of the uh, Syrian people or of the Syrian uh, revolution. Um, so there's again a question popping up from um, Maria Karkou, and she says, and I think it's an interesting question is, how, what do you think is the impact of the war in Ukraine on the Middle East? That's <laughs> a long story. Of course, the question of Maria is, is very interesting and very challenging. Um, for, for the time being, uh, I think one could observe what are the Middle Eastern reactions to the war in Ukraine more than what will be the consequences. I don't know about the consequences, but I see that in today, if you look at all governments of the Middle East, there is something uh, very uh, interesting and new that is taking place. Uh, if you look at the Gulf countries, and, and, and by saying that, it's not positive. I mean, uh, uh, the Gulf countries, except for Kuwait, none of them did denounce or uh, did uh, uh, reject uh, or condemn the Russian invasion. And it seems, according to some uh, press, that uh, the crown prince in both Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates did not even respond to, put, to Biden's request to condemn the, uh, uh, the Russian uh, aggression. Uh, this is mainly because uh, they are opposed to the American deal, nuclear deal, a possible nuclear deal with Iran, because many of them who hated Obama see in Biden a third Obama administration. Uh, some of them, uh, they want an American support in Yemen before making any move when it comes to Ukraine. So they are domesticating, in a way, the Ukrainian question based on their local calculations. In other places, um, people, or, or, or even in, the, I mean, here we're not into the governments, but among some uh, debates um, in, in the newspapers, among some intellectuals, uh, you have this tendency as well of bringing the United States, of saying, what about uh, Iraq? Uh, what happened in that place before? So uh, what we hear in Europe has its echoes there and is used as well there. There is no clear position against the Russian uh, invasion. Uh, people are divided between those who blame NATO and those who blame uh, Putin. Uh, and uh, if we go to the Maghreb, there are other considerations. Of course, we don't have time to talk about them. But even in Israel, uh, there is lots of hesitation. And there are lots of papers about Russian oligarchs who are under international sanctions now, who are uh, fleeing to Israel with their money. Uh, plus, uh, uh, Bennett tried to play the mediator between uh, Zelensky and Putin with no success. Maybe Turkey has the most successful approach so far and trying to play a role and to benefit from what's happening. But even that, I'm not sure because this is an ongoing process and it's very difficult to expect things. Uh, I, I just wonder again, maybe from the, from the other perspective. So this was the governmental or let's say state, state <laughs> positions um, because you're also like you have been living between, uh, I don't know if you still do between Lebanon and, uh, and France. Yeah. Um, and also a lot of our Syrian friends are based in Beirut, unfortunately, because they cannot go back. How do they, from a, let's say, um, political movement perspective, look at what is happening in Ukraine? Because now this is, of course, the state position. In, in Lebanon, very divided as well. Okay. And the division uh, doesn't always follow uh, what we know of the Lebanese divisions, meaning uh, pro or anti-Hezbollah. Uh, you have people who might be anti-Hezbollah, but uh, are silent when it comes to Ukraine, uh, because... Um, um, well, because there is a fascination for the strong man who is Putin, who can challenge, who can defy, who can uh, uh, do whatever he wants. Uh, and there is something also that one could observe. It's not scientific what I'm saying. It, it requires uh, much more work to be sure about it. But there is something, even if the C Ukrainians are also Christian, but uh, Putin is incarnating for some Christians this idea of Christian, powerful leader, especially uh, among the Orthodox uh, in Lebanon and Syria, uh, who uh, is challenging the West and wants the dignity and the glory of Russia back. So uh, there are divisions that are related to uh, pro and anti-Hezbollah, but also there are other divisions related to, to different factors. 
I think the whole uh, Middle East is divided when it comes to this war, not only the governments, most of the governments are either silent or prefer not to take a position, as I said, except for Kuwait, because Kuwait was annexed by Iraq and know, knows what it means when a country says that the other is an artificial or is, is a, a, a historical mistake. Uh, but for the others, they were either silent or they voted uh, finally in the General Assembly. They voted against the uh, invasion, but uh, they were almost forced to do it. When they had the possibility in the Security Council, the United Arab Emirates, for instance, it's, uh, it abstained, they didn't vote against it. Um, because it's now already 8.30 and we have been going on for one hour and a half, I think I would try to um, wrap it up and I would allow myself to ask a last question because it's one that I think is important to debate. Um, you have been describing this tendency of authoritarianism and this fascination also that we see. Um, you have illustrated now the case of Lebanon, um, but we also see it, of course, in the West, um, the uprising of uh, or the, the strengthening of um, the right wing populism in several countries, okay. um, among them Germany. Um, we also see at the same time um, a fear right now that, of course, everyone or most of the populations right now in Western Europe, at least I would say, are um, supporting the sanctions against Russia um, to sanction um, the, the attack on Ukraine. But at the same time, of course, now there are prices rising um, yes. and you also have this kind of short term, I would say, memory that many people fear, right? Um, in that context, and because you describe yourself as a leftist and you are also part of this thinking, the left today in Europe in general says, yes, we have to condemn this war. And I was quite surprised, I have to say, I would say their, situ like their position is much more outspoken when it comes to the Ukrainian uh, situation than the Syrian one. So I was quite lucky. There are very little, I would say, insignificant amount of voices that are uh, not condemning Putin. But the question we are in front of and has been raised several times is, is that most of these voices say, okay, we don't want to fund the military. Yeah. We don't want to have a military answer to these kind of aggressions. It doesn't lead anywhere. And of course, yeah. they are very good, um, very good factors to suppose that. But then what do you think is the debate that should happen today among a progressive leftist transnationally um, to protect civilians at the same time when you face these kind of leaders that are basically protected by the international uh, system yeah. as it is today? Yeah. Well, this is a very uh, difficult question, uh, Christine, but I think, yes, uh, allow me just to say something that it's true now that many of those who used to defend Putin before uh, feel a bit uh, embarrassed. They try even to erase some of their YouTube videos or some of what they said a few years before. But even those people, when they say that Putin has changed and that the Putin that they are seeing now, it's not the same that they knew before and defended before. This is, of course, wrong because the whole rise of Putin to power uh, went in parallel with the use of force, with violence, with uh, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity in, in Grozny, with the series of war that we, we mentioned in Georgia, in Ukraine, in Syria. So it's not something new and that Putin now uh, has surprised them. So that's why they modified uh, their position. But it's for sure that there is something uh, taking place in the public opinion in Europe. When I saw recently that 90% of the German uh, support the sanctions, 80% of the French, 89% of the Italian, that was an Ipsos uh, 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 figures that, that were mentioned the, the day before yesterday. It means that, yes, this war has shocked the Europeans uh, and showed them that they're not far away. And it's not only the refugees who sometimes arrive who remind them of the horrors of the war. It is now on their uh, land. And this might be an opportunity uh, to uh, work on uh, new alliances uh, among leftists or among progressives in general against the war, opposed to the war, but not opposed to the war with the uh, old uh, fashioned rhetoric in which you're opposed to the war, but you don't take a real uh, position against the aggressor and against the responsible of the war. So I think one should determine the position and then try to think of all kinds of alternatives to, uh, to violence or to violent response. For now, 
the best thing to do is to support what the Ukrainians want. And it seems that they want to resist the invasion. And if some governments are willing to help them, uh, fine. For us, we're not anyway connected or related to the whole weapon question. Uh, we can have our position when it comes to with or against sending weapons, but it will not change uh, things anyway. What we need to create is those solidarity networks with the Ukrainians, with the Syrians, with the Palestinians, with the Yemenis, with, with sub-Saharan Africans who are under pressure, with any uh, cause, I mean, that uh, bringing back the long heritage of the left uh, uh, when it comes to internationalism, to humanism, to solidarity, uh, and uh, the rise of the uh, far right, but even among uh, many non-far right categories, uh, the lack of interest in democratic institutions and uh, the anti-establishment uh, uh, stances that we hear uh, did allow the Russians to use their propaganda and to decredibilize democratic institutions in the West that have definitely lots of weaknesses and vulnerabilities and uh, many mistakes were committed and part of the elite is corrupt and the whole international system uh, requires an attention and, and uh, there should be reforms, but those reforms cannot come except from countries that have democratic systems where the public opinion can pressure and uh, can push for a certain change. Otherwise, um, it will not move and we will be always confronted to a situation where uh, the war will impose on us a position uh, we cannot prevent things, uh, we cannot have an influence. And uh, I know it's not an easy task and I don't see it happening soon, uh, but maybe with a new generation, uh, maybe with the uh, university students, maybe with those progressive uh, uh, groups that are trying to do things related to feminism, uh, related to uh, environment, uh, related to racism, uh, related to confronting and, and fighting all forms of discrimination, I think the potential is among this kind of new political culture that will bring uh, together different causes and will then look as well at the causes of democracy, of uh, human rights, of social justice, not only in the country where it lives, but elsewhere in the world. Uh, either we think uh, as an international community, we as civil society, uh, members, activists, intellectuals, workers, etc., uh, or we will remain uh, contained in our territory and uh, uh, everything will be imposed on us and the best thing we can do is to react. So this is, I think, uh, an important question and would require lots of work uh, between people who are interested in, in dealing with it. Yeah, and I think it's an important one that is also a call for us to, to, to think together. Um, there are, I don't know yet, the, how, how is your energy? Because there are three more the questions, but- I'm, I'm ready. Have, yes, okay, yeah. great. So then I would quickly call these. Um, so maybe to, um, there's a question regarding the book by Christina also Laranjo and she asks, so on your observation on the emancipated new generation and the ongoing movement, is this part of your book or could you recommend any further literature that tries to... No, it's not part of, of the book. I, I can recommend literature, yes. Uh, I can send you an email and maybe she can be in touch with you uh, with uh, some bibliography. I don't okay, have so... a book in mind now. Yeah. Okay, so mm -hmm. Christina Laranjo, if you listen to me, maybe you can just write your email in the chat and then this um, we could pick up on that. Um, then there is a still um, a question regarding um, this idea of, so more on the Syria-Ukraine question. Um, the person asks if Professor Majid argues that Syria was a laboratory for political violence, this laboratory's results were used by the Russian government, not only against Ukraine, but also against its own Russian population. One can fear, of course, that uh, violence uh, would uh, develop in Russia if there is a strong opposition uh, to Putin. And we know now that there is a legislation uh, that uh, would uh, in jail people for 15 years if they uh, are opposed to the war. Even they cannot use the term war. They have to talk about a military operation. Uh, and we have seen thousands of people arrested uh, in uh, Russian cities 
while demonstrating against the war and against the invasion of Ukraine. So definitely there is a violence, uh, a violent uh, reaction by the Russian authorities, by, by the Putin regime against uh, the opposition. Uh, there were in the past many assassinations and assassinations attempts against journalists and dissidents. Uh, and we can see that happening again. But of course, I, I would not compare what happened in Syria to what might happen in uh, other places. Uh, I said it was a laboratory of violence because everything was tested in Syria, everything. If we're talking about non-conventional weapon, uh, chemical weapons were used. If we're talking about bombing, not only the Air Force attacks, but also barrel bombs, which are the most primitive, barbaric, and criminal ways of, of killing people. Uh, torture, systematic torture, industry of torture, uh, rape, the, the policy of hunger, the question of telling people that no one could save them by uh, the displacement through those humanitarian corridors. In international law, according to the uh, fourth Geneva Convention, civilians should be protected. They should be protected where they live, not they should be protected if they are displaced and if uh, there is an ethnic uh, cleansing or demographic modification by just expelling them after bombing them and besieging them. So everything was tested in Syria, name it, all kinds of horrors were tested with no limits uh, by the Syrian regime and its allies. Uh, and in some cases by ISIS and in some minor cases by other groups. There are statistics. We know who killed whom in Syria. Uh, when you bump an area, uh, everyone knows what kind of air force, uh, the planes belong to which country. We're not in uh, the 19th century now. Everything is documented. Uh, all airports and security services know who's flying and who's bombing which region. Uh, we know who disappeared where and what happened to those who disappeared in Assad uh, jails. So uh, Syria is an exception, but one can fear that with the amount of violence that was tolerated in Syria for seven years, new amounts or new intensity of violence might appear in new conflicts and in new civil wars. Uh, and uh, there are alarming signs of that uh, already in the Middle East, but this can be uh, outside the Middle East. Plus Syria witnessed as well, the professionalization of mercenaries through the Wagner uh, society. Uh, and uh, it witnessed the jihadists on the Sunni level, on the Shia level. It witnessed occupations. If you look at the Syrian map today, it's fragmented. There are many occupations. There is a Turkish occupation, American occupation, and an old Israeli occupation and definitely now the largest occupation that is the Russian and the Iranian one. So uh, what do you want in terms of regional, local, international, uh, the types of the actors, the non-state actors, everything was tested in this Syrian uh, geography on the Syrian people. Uh, and uh, that's why I, I fear that more and more we will see sign, we will see atrocities in conflicts as long as impunity uh, remains in place and as long as no criminals are arrested. It's true now that there are things taking place in Germany when it comes to impunity in, in Syria, and that's excellent news. But of course, uh, we're talking about another level, the one of those who are uh, in, in, in charge and uh, the head of states or the, the head of organizations who committed war crimes and crimes against men. Yes, because there is, for example, right now, very interesting initiative by the new head of the International Criminal Court who has been evoking crimes that were committed in Georgia uh, by certain, Russia's offic uh, certain Russian officials. Um, one of them has even deceased, if I'm not mistaken, um, as basically um, a sign of relevance for what is happening today. So there is a possibility also, even if from a legal perspective, it's impossible to transfer the Syrian um, the Syrian atrocities in front of this court because of um, the veto right of Russia and because Syria is not member to, to this court. Um, there's a last question I, I think I would, would like to take and then we could uh, sum it up. Um, it's about the question of no-fly zone and I think it's an important one because it has been debated very much in the Syrian case and of course yeah. it's heavily been debated right now also when it comes to um, Ukraine. Okay. 
Um, so the person questions, um, would a no-fly zone help? Would Putin retaliate with nuclear weapons? If NATO didn't fly for other nations like Ukraine, does that, doesn't that put the light to the claim that Europe didn't care about Syrians and the Middle Easterns? Now, um, there was less importance for Syria and the Middle Easterns, uh, definitely. Anyway, it's, uh, it's an observation. I mean, uh, uh, the uh, European support, humanitarian support as well, not only to Syrians, but to all refugees coming from the Middle East or from Africa uh, has been, I mean, very limited in comparison to some great solidarity that we see today. And one should support the solidarity of today while condemning the lack of solidarity in the past uh, uh, to, to make it uh, just uh, clear. Now, uh, when it comes to the no-fly zone, it's much more complicated in, in Ukraine. And I think it's even impossible because it will uh, require uh, uh, operations or it will require clashes with the Russian Air Force and with the Russian uh, defense system. In Syria, it was much easier before uh, the Russian intervention, because at the time there was only the Syrian regime that was using the air force. And if there was a will to impose a no-fly zone, they could have imposed it in 2012 and 2013 directly as they did in uh, Libya. Now, the problem at the time was that in Libya, they did it through the Security Council because uh, Russia and China abstained from voting, didn't oppose their veto. If they had to do it in Syria, uh, it won't be through the United Nations system, it should be outside, and then you will need a clear uh, justification legally among them that you are helping uh, people who are under the danger of being exterminated. There are some uh, possibilities for to justify the intervention, but it won't uh, have happened anyway through the United Nations system because of the possible, uh, the sure, in fact, uh, Russian uh, veto. So the alternative was, and that's what I mentioned 2012 as a turning point, is to give anti-air missile to the Syrian opposition, the famous uh, Stinger miss missiles that showed how efficient they were. They were in the Afghanistan war uh, against the same Soviet uh, army. When I say the same, it means that the uh, airplanes of the Syrian regime are the same that were used by, by uh, the Russian army in Afghanistan. So it was possible to neutralize the air force of the Syrian regime and to send a message that this is a red line. It didn't happen. After that, no fly zone when Russia was already there became impossible. And I think it's impossible in Ukraine. Yes, so to sum it up, um, there were a lot of chances basically how to prevent um, the extreme political, humanitarian, civilian catastrophe that we have been witnessing in Syria over the last 11 years, but also to preserve. But there's still a lot of preservation when it comes to what have been the initial goals of the uprising in 2011, while people are being displaced, while people are being exiled, but um, also have finally finding maybe the space to come together and to think. Um, I think it has been, of course, um, not a very um, uplifting discussion tonight, okay. given the nature of the subject. But I would yeah. like to thank you, Ziad, for uh, keeping the head up and still being so um, um, so clear and so precise. And when it comes to your anal analysis, because I also know that you are, um, I mean, in addition to being a scholar, of course, you are um, heavily um, involved in what is happening in Syria in the sense of having friends, family, and so on. So I think for most of us, who are talking here, we also have a very emotional part when it comes to, to what is happening. And I think it is also good in the sense that it reminds us that it's not just about geopolitics. Um, so while we try to address geopolitical questions, it's also important to remind us again that there are really the futures and lives of people at stake and also the ability of uh, independent civil society to basically counter governmental positions. So thank you very much for taking the time tonight um and uh, for being so um so much on board also on shifting the focus from syria also or to see really what we can learn from syria for ukraine um i don't know how optimistic we are that this might prevent another bloodshed in ukraine um i get that most of us who have been witnessing what is happening in syria are pretty pessimistic
Yes. Um, however, as one famous Syrian playwright put it, we are, uh, Sadat Lawanus, he always says, we are doomed to hope. So in that sense, um, we must keep fighting uh, peacefully um, with the means we have um, with our words, with our discussions and with gathering each other, I think, and exchanging opinions and also debating things that might have been undebatable um, yesterday. And yeah, thank you, Herr Harald, also for being here. Yes. Um, thank you, Disorient and the Shark and all the team that you don't see who has make, uh, made this possible. And thank you, of course, for everyone who has been particip participating, friends we know, but also um, a lot of people we don't know. So please spread the word. Um, let us use at least this kind of digital room to um, have more discussions possible. Um, because I think uh, the people deserve our attention, um, even if we feel tired and desperate at times. And thank you, Christine. And, and thanks to everyone who was patient and who uh, uh, participated. And thanks to Harald for once again uh, translating uh, the book and for the uh, edition Nautilus. Do, do I pronounce it correctly? Nautilus? Yeah? Nautilus, yes. Nautilus for, for publishing it. <laughs> yes. uh, and thanks for you and for Adopt the Revolution and Disorient and Al Sharp. Uh, yeah, and uh, hope to see you again uh, to talk about uh, topics with a bit of optimism, let's say. Yes, and in that oh, sense, you. just to put again the book. So if you, and I strongly advise you to support your local bookseller and not uh, the big companies who, whose names I won't <laughs> mention here. And when you are going to the bookstore, most of the bookstores right now are also organizing very special um, curation of Ukrainian authors and literature. So I also invite you to um, take home the book of the art and then maybe also some Ukrainian writers and um, try to see um, how we can connect the dots. So in that sense, I hope we can spread solidarity on that level and thank you everyone and have a good um, Tuesday evening and let's hope that things are gonna get better than we expect them to be. Have a great evening. Bye bye everyone. Thank you, Shukran. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. <laughs>